Hello there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. This podcast will be very special because I have prepared a complete organ demonstration of the largest pipe organ in Lithuania, which stands in Vilnius University St. John's Church. This is where I work. And uh, just recently, I've been invited to give this uh, demonstration to a group of German lawyers who, par- who participated in lawyers conference at, at the Vilnius University. So I recorded this uh, demonstration I, and I'm making this into um, a podcast for a wider audience uh, now. And these people uh, from Germany were very curious uh, about uh, all things about the organ, how organ works, how organ sounds are produced, uh, what is the mechanic uh, of the organ, even the historical parts were very fascinating. Uh, So today I'm going not only to give uh, the overview of the main families of the organ sounds uh, with complete uh, demonstrations and improvisations on this magnificent instrument, but also I'll talk about the uh, history of of this particular instrument and uh, of the organ in general. We'll we'll talk about the antiquity, we'll talk about how the organ came into the church, we'll even briefly touch about the the grand instruments uh, with seven manuals and pedals which stand uh, in Atlantic City and in Sydney, the largest pipe organ in the world, and how they sound, uh, how, how they can be perceived. So, I hope you will find this uh, or uh, organ demonstration inspiring. Let's go to the show. We are we are on the balcony of the largest one of the largest churches in one of the beautiful, most beautiful churches in Lithuania, uh, which houses the, the, the largest pipe organ in, in the country. It has uh, three manuals, three keyboards basically, and uh, uh, 64 stops. This is what we call stop, the kister and then don't you pick it. And uh, uh, this instrument is completely mechanical, mm-hmm. which means that I will engage all these stops and other mechanical devices by hand or by feet. So uh, this instrument has about three and a half thousand pipes inside of this. Grand, uh, grand uh, facade, and uh, its history is quite complex, but very fascinating. And we briefly touch about uh, how this organ came into this church, because originally it wasn't built for for the university church, but it was built in in another Jesuit church in Belarus. In, in today's Belarus, uh, the the city or town will be called Polotsk. And they had a Jesuit church there, and uh, they had, of course, a strong Jesuit connection with Bauer University. And at the end of the 18th century, uh, one of the most famous Königsberg, uh, or East Russian, uh, basically, orgel, orgel, organ, organ master, uh, Adam Gottlob Kasparini, came from Königsberg and built a prototype for this organ. Uh, smaller instrument, uh, one, one keyboard and 22 stops, not 64, but 22, with pedals. And uh, uh, in, in the middle, about uh, in the 1830s, when the Tsar regime closed down the Jesuit church in the Belarus, in, in Polotsk, uh, our university purchased and transferred this instrument to this church, which was later enlarged by local organ builders and made into the three manual instrument. And even at the end of the 19th century, it was made even bigger and bigger, which became the largest instrument in the country. But then later, Soviet regime came and, and this instrument was this, this, dismantled and the pipes were taken out of the organ. Uh, um, drunk men could, could climb into the, into the instrument itself and uh, damage the precious metal pipes, right? But even in, in the Soviet times, at the, end of the, at the end of the 1970s or in the beginning of the 1980s, they began to understand it, the regime understand it. This instrument has tremendous value as a historical model. 
so they started to uh, restore the facade. Not the instrument itself, but just the facade, the, the gilding, the carvings, and the, the facade metal pipes, which incidentally have almost 90% of tin alloy. Tin. So basically, I will talk about the pipes and alloys and, and wooden pipes and constructions. Uh, all day long, but uh, you have to stop me. <laughs> By the way, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> you. Uh, you can take. Okay, so, so we'll make it short. Uh, and I will not talk too much because I want to demonstrate some of the most colorful and beautiful stuff of this instrument. So uh, basically, so it started to restore the the, 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 the facade, not the Soviet, but our local uh, uh, monument uh, preservers, basically, uh, restorers. And uh, in, in 1983, they began to reconstruct the inside of the instrument with the idea, with the vision that someday this instrument will be playable again. And uh, it happened uh, actually a reality in, in, the, in July of 2000. So in July of uh, July 17th of 2000, uh, there came 150 organ organ builders from all over the world in, in, uh, to participate in in a symposium of International Society of Organ Builders, uh, which took place in all three Baltic states, uh, in Vilnius, Riga, and Ali. and. Uh, in an entire weekend or even an entire week, I don't remember exactly, but they came and visited all the important historical instruments in all the Baltic area. So this uh, instrument was inaugurated as part of this symposium. And I was uh, just, uh, just completed my master's study at the Lithuanian Academy of Music at that time and played a part in that inaugural concert. So a few words about the, the mechanical part of this instrument is very fascinating because, as you see, um, the facade is quite Baroque-like, right? And to, uh, to be more precise, is is German origin because uh, uh, Kasparini, Adam Gordon Kasparini, came from East Prussia and built the uh, instrument according to the Thuringian style because he visited uh, uh, organs in uh, Thuringia uh, and, um, and uh, apprenticed with the greatest uh, uh, organ builder of that time in Thuringia, he called uh, Hans, uh, Johann, Johann, uh, Hans, no, Han, Johann Christoph Trost. And Trost was um, uh, very famous for his organs, who, which inspired instruments playable by Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach. So basically, even this instrument has some ideas that could be uh, basically applied to the organ music of Bach as well. Or the, any of the Bach school, any of the Baroque uh, German area. Basically, this, this is uh, quite a Baroque instrument. But uh, when, when organ builders restored this in the 1980s, they thought maybe we could also reconstruct the instrument in a way that it was also playable in the 19th century. And that was completely different from the 18th century. This was a romantic period. Romantic period meant more more foundational stuff, more, uh, more orchestral-like sounds. And you will hear that uh, um, also style in, in today's, not only Baroque uh, stuff, uh, improvisations, but also um, sort of uh, modal uh, and symphonic style. Uh, romantic and even 20th century techniques applied to, to, to depict the colors of this instrument and, uh, and also the five most important families of this instrument, stop families of this instrument. So let's talk about the stop families, uh, the, the pipes and, and its construction. First of all, uh, organ uh, pipes have five families. These metal pipes, uh, we call them principles. Principle, it comes from Latin principalis, uh, which means chef. chef. 
in the main, the main, the main register, the main stuff of this organ, and they usually are built from from metal. And in, in the facade, you see about 90 percent of, but in the in the inside of the instrument, you can find more of the lead and tin alloy mixed together. Lead and tin are more of the two of the most important alloys for the building and uh, and uh, casting casting uh, pipe organ metals. Lead, blind, blind, So lead actually is quite uh, dangerous for your health, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if, you, if you if you chew or or touch, <laughs> so organ builders uh, handle the pipes. Uh, I work very carefully with special gloves and uh, don't put them into the mouth too much. But because they have to really blow and uh, check the, the, the pipes, it's, it's not too dangerous. And European European Union or EU Council basically uh, tried to forbid um, all lead materials, right? A, a few years ago or a 10 years ago. <laughs> and one of the uh, victims of that uh, were organs. Of course, because lead is everywhere in organs. But our uh, main uh, European organ builders, also from Germany, especially from Germany, they came to to, to Brussels and uh, and said, and lobbied basically a European Council said, no, 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 it's not too dangerous if the pipes are standing still and if the people are, uh, you know, from some distance, nothing is really evaporating and you cannot really smell it. So it's not too dangerous, and, and it's uh, thanks uh, to this uh, process, it's still allowed to build the pipe organs and uh, pipes from lead as well. So it's, it's not a strange situation, but we managed to handle this correctly. So the uh, principles, you were probably wondering how the principles sound uh, is constructed, right? So principles, these are all the principles from different manuals. And just above me are uh, the principles from the main manual, from the main keyboard. We call them Hauptwerk. Hauptwerk. Yeah. In German, basically, it's, it's the main work. Uh, Hauptwerk, I don't know why they call it, because the pipe works are um, usually called Werk. Werk. Uh, Oberwerk, uh, Rückwerk, for example, if they, if they could have the um, um, special cabinet which would hang in the under the balcony, that would be called Rückwerk. Yes. In sometimes, sometimes positive, Rück positive. So Ober positive, Oberwerk, it's sort of interchangeable in terms. All right, so uh, let's hear this uh, facade principle eight for the Uh, 
inches, right? Yeah. In Europe, except in, in, in England. But, uh, but in, in Baroque time, uh, they had a system, uh, not a uh, metrical system, but uh, uh, other, uh, the other system. And uh, eight feet, eight foot principle means that the largest pipe, the base C, this pipe, is uh, eight feet long. Which means, in today's terms, about uh, 240 centimeters, about 2 meters 40 centimeters. And if you check uh, for the length of these, uh, of these of facade pipes, here is the middle C, the lowest B C, here C, and here is the C sharp on the other side. They are approximately this, of that length, uh, 240 centimeters. And, um, which means that uh, all of the eight foot stops here can be uh, 240 centimeters long. And uh, which means that if we, if we cut the pipe in half, we we'll make four foot long, right? But then the sound would be one octave higher. Mm -hmm. Like the string, right? We would make the string shorter than exactly one octave the uh, higher yes. stop. I will demonstrate how it sounds. For example, uh, principle eight contrasted with octave four of the same stop. as small yeah. uh, and that, but that's not all because you can play with two uh, for the stop Yeah, principle one. <laughs> Look, this is this, the, the tallest pipe of one foot principle, which is called sedecima, Italian word, sedecima, um, sedecima of one, one, one foot. because we have many uh, uh, bass sounding stops here played with the pedal uh, with the feet. That's why I have special organist shoes and that's why my shoes are worn out and <laughs> when you see that um, I should really take care of my shoes better. But this is to remind you how much I practice, right? <laughs> how much I practice the pedal work when I will play the pedals. Um, all oh, right. Uh, while I'm at it, let's play the, some of the deepest sound of this instrument, which is of course um, principle 16. Uh, this means uh, pipe work, which is uh, about five meters long. These pedal towers on the right side and on the left side, they are about five meters long. Here is the. And see the, the, the Here it is. 
the lowest sound of principle 16. Guess what? This is not the end. Because we have <laughs> Subas 32. <laughs> become more powerful and if you have uh, trouble troubles with hearing you will feel it. Trouble with heart as well. Or uh, maybe I, I can fix your heart if you have troubles with <laughs> 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 Three pipes together of six, 32 foot land. Four. Please touch, touch this and Vibration. Talking about vibrations, where we have this interesting stuff called timbre. You know what timbre is? The, the, the kettle drum, uh, the, 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 the symphonic, symphonic orchestra. They have this drum. How can you talk? church organ in the world, anywhere in the world, is uh, the largest in Passau, uh, church, in church building, but it's still not the largest in the world, because the largest in the world uh, are in two places now, uh, which have, uh, which has uh, not three manuals like here, not five manuals like in Passau, but uh, for example, seven keyboards, seven manuals. We call them manuals because, uh, of course, manus in Latin, in Latin is hand. Uh, and pedals because uh, uh, pedus uh, in, in Latin is, of course, foot. And um, uh, so there are seven of them. One, two, three, four. Imagine, uh, look at me. Five, <laughs> how tense I am. Six and seven is up somewhere here. And of course, you can play this way, and this way, and this way, this way, this way, this way. 
Yeah, and, and jump around, yes, I will jump a little bit for you on three manuals, but it's not <laughs> quite the fun when you have seven. Uh, I can uh, really uh, only imagine, because I, I never played these largest organs in the world. By the way, they stand in America and in Australia. Uh, in America, it was uh, for a long time uh, the only playable seven manual organ in the world, in Atlantic City, uh, in New Jersey. Atlantic City, they have this seven, seven manual grand monster instrument with about uh, uh, more than 1,000 stops, and not 64 stops right here, <laughs> not like uh, 131 stops like in uh, in um, in Latvia, uh, in um, in uh, Liepaja Cathedral, the largest mechanical organ in the world, when I played uh, last month. And even not the 200 or 300 instruments that are like five manuals range, but this is a huge monster instrument with more than 1,000 stops. Not pipes, but stops. It's endless, the, the stop combinations, basically. In Atlantic City, in America, and also in Sydney, in Town Hall, in Australia. And now the Sydney organ is restored and can be playable. And they say that, that these monster organs have uh, not like five, five meter long pipes, but 20 meter long pipes, like five story buildings. You can imagine the sound. We heard 32 foot stop. They have 64 foot stop uh, played by, by foot. And you can, you can really only uh, determine not exact pitch but only vibrations and when you play those vibrations it, it really is the effect of a helicopter hovering above the building <laughs> it's really that uh, uh, roar tremendous roar and it's quite dangerous for the for the building here i was joking about this uh, windows and uh, breaking uh, ceiling and uh, columns but in sydney and in america of course the, the building itself had to be reinforced to accommodate those lowest vibrations. To be specific, uh, it's about 8 hertz uh, vibrations. And how old are those instruments? They're not very old. They're beginning of the 20th century. Because the older, the oldest instruments never were so huge. Mm -hmm. It's only in, in modern era, in industrial times, where, where you know, we have to Monsters. Yes. And actually, the, uh, the, the Middle Age organs, right? The organs in ancient Greece and Rome, they were very, very small and, and delicate. In fact, uh, kings and emperors had them yet in home. And in ancient Greece, the instruments were not in, in temples or religious houses, um, but in circus arenas, in, uh, where gladiators fought, right? They play organs there, but not with exact church organs, but they call them water organs because <coughs> instead of bellows, which uh, are in, required to, to, to have this pressure, air pressure, they had uh, water reservoirs on each side of the instrument with a few rows of metal pipes. This is called in, in, uh, in uh, English. My God, my God. And uh, in uh, 79 AD, you remember when Pompeii was, uh, uh, the city town of Pompeii in ancient Rome was really um, covered by ash, volcanic ash from the Vesuvius, right? Uh, everything was uh, really covered uh, to the ground and some of the instruments as well. So scientists discovered, rediscovered in the 20th century and dig it up, dig, dug up this instrument, ancient hydraulics, and reconstructed. And it could be still heard on YouTube as well. <laughs> it's a very gentle instrument. It can be uh, sung together with uh, some poems by Homer and um, things like that. All right, enough talk. Now let's, uh, let's get some of the more principal stuff. Uh, for example, principle eight and four combined. Two. 
accompany church singing, uh, choral singing, uh, congregational singing, uh, as well of, of, on some festive, uh, festive um, sounds, uh, preludiums, fumes, uh, uh, variations, chaconas, uh, all kinds of uh, baroque type compositions that are not uh, constructed with chorales, not like uh, choral variations, not choral fantasias, uh, because they require more elegant and more colorful stops we call reeds and flutes as well. We, heard, we will hear, for example, the next family of our stop is called uh, the flute. And they really imitate orchestral flutes because in the diameter they are uh, wider than the principal. And actually uh, they sound more delicate and gentle. And sometimes really you cannot really even differentiate them from orchestral or block flute or other various kinds of flutes. Each of the manuals have several flutes combined so we can really demonstrate them here. For example, the first manual has flauto major, which in Italian of course is the major flute, the flute uh, because uh, it is flauto minor also, the smaller. <laughs> The larger is of 8 foot level and the smaller is of 4 foot level. So we'll hear this gentle sound.
more pronounced. What happens if I engage flauto of two foot level? <laughs> and flutes. The third style uh, family is called the strings. Strings imitate violin, uh, gamba, uh, viola, uh, violoncello in the bass, everything that is string, string related. And we have some nice string sounds right here. A violon, for example, very gentle. Usually we play very slow with strings.
soft and gentle, it can, can be quite powerful and festive uh, on many occasions, very sad, I can play with like for funeral and, and um, very solemn occasions, I can play for graduation ceremonies, playing uh, national, uh, national anthems and uh, go down with the, the student <laughs> academic uh, anthem. Um, it all comes down to this tremendous power of the organ has and then the tremendous colorful abilities. Imagine 64 foot stops. You can really uh, calculate how many stop combinations simply by uh, uh, basically uh, calculating 64 times 64. That's how many abilities, colorful abilities there are in this organ. Not so all of them are used every day, but but uh, the more I play here, the more I work here maintaining this instrument and tuning this instrument, the more I discover the intricate abilities, and especially at night, for example, when lights are out and everything, everywhere is dark, you can hear about six or seven seconds of reverberation here mm -hmm. when playing the, all the stops and all the pipes. It's quite powerful. And I would say even a religious experience for some people uh, because you can play very gently as well, like meditation, uh, or very powerfully, like also another kind of meditation, right? And uh, the most fascinating thing to me that only one person can do this, right? Uh, not, not necessarily 100 mm -hmm. beats yes, yes. orchestra, okay. orchestra, but it can really imitate mm -hmm. orchestral sound quite well and even accompany. Uh, silent movies like uh, like they did in, in, in the beginning of the 20th century. Then they didn't have orchestras, they had organists playing uh, soundtracks, mm -hmm. uh, improvisations. So we do these things in our church as well and uh, try to uh, make this organ, uh, organ art come alive in, 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 in Lithuania. So, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I have one question. Yes. Did I see it right? Did you play on the first minute? What happens when I play exactly? This is because I engage couplers. Your uh, of Deutsch is Koppel. Koppel. They couple the manuals together. These little pedals. When I play.
the world here. So quite gentle pieces as well, like the choral variations in other situations. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yes. yes, of course, but because this is all mechanical, you see, if I, oh, you are probably curious what happens inside, let's, let's check. <laughs> I oh. haven't done this before for, for listeners, but you are the precious audience to me today, <laughs> and I'm going to demonstrate how it all works. Let's go, it will hold. So, here is... I will demonstrate how the sound is produced now, of course, because, because uh, you see now we can go. There is a, uh, there is a uh, abstract in, in German or the, basically the tracker in English. And, and they, they connect the end of the keys to the ventus the, uh, uh, underneath the pipes. Ventus. So what happens when you depress the key? Here. Uh, if I want to this C to sound, for example, with, with this nice roar of loud on the third manual, I have to do two things. I have to draw out this stop handle which aligns the, the, the small, uh, small, um, basically aligns the, the slider above, under the, the pipe wall with the end of the pipes. And the, the air can go into the pipes. When I engage this, this cloud cloud, for example, stop the handle. And then I can choose whatever key I want. This is this only for, for the third manual, for, for the third, for the upper uh, The pedal board is, is a little more complex. It's uh, sort of the same, but only uh, underneath us. And it also has trackers, which connect end of the pedals uh, with the ventils, which are underneath the pipe works in the winches. So you see, under each stop, under each manual, wooden boxes before the winches, and the air is produced by by blowers, by motors. Today. But the earlier days, of course, they call it calcanta. I don't know where it comes from this word, but we call we have this uh, stop, which is called calcant. What happens when I press? No air here, so it's it's a symbol for for the uh, uh, strong man sitting uh, uh, next to the bellows and waiting for my signal. And <laughs> in the earlier days, there was a bell for him with this calcantan stop. I could engage this bell, ring this bell, and, and the, he would start ringing the bellows now, pumping. It's just a, a matter of, you know, linguistics now, and, uh, and uh, simple model is enough here. But sometimes they reconstruct uh, replicas of 18th century and 17th century instrument that can be pumped by hand or by feet. That's very fascinating because with motor blowers it's all equal, equal wind supply. 
it's uh, no differentiation, no like breathing, right? But with pumping by hand and feet, the organ really breathes like a like human being. And um, one of the fascinating things is history, how the organ came into the church. It was the first as I used the circus instrument as a pagan instrument, basically. But one, about 1,000 years ago, it came to the church, into monasteries and cathedrals in Europe as a symbol of universal harmony. You know, this uh, uh, ancient uh, um, classical um, system of, of uh, belief that each of the planets make sounds. Unheard mm -hmm. yes, yes. to humans, but they, while they move through their orbits, they make sounds of some kind. Sphere. Sphere music, yeah. Uh, they had three different types of music at that time. Musica humana, which is human voice, right? Musica uh, instrumentalis, which is instrument music, violins, wind uh, instruments, and organs as well. And the third type was musica mundana, this, uh, this, uh, this spherical music. And the uh, organ had this uh, very interesting uh, symbol of that because each of the types is uh, like a different person and uh, they together uh, create this uh, heavenly harmony basically and uh, recreate the sounds that are heard perhaps in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the sun by the heavenly uh, choirs and archangels. So they believed and uh, one of the reasons they used, started to use this instrument in churches is this symbol of universal harmony. Excellent question. <laughs> question. <laughs> any, any other questions? Yeah, I still connected to that, that question. Can we see the point? The organ where the air comes into the instrument? Is it possible? Bellows. Yes, you want to see the bellows. Uh, it's not possible, but I will show it. <laughs> <laughs>If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog Secrets of Organ Playing at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you online really soon.